Here's problem six from the 2019 AP Calc BC free response set. Non-calculator question, and as number six almost always does, it involves a series. So what they start you off with, and this was actually above the problem statement whenever you open the test booklet, uh, they give you this graph and they give you this table. And if you read the problem statement, function f has derivatives of all orders for all real numbers x. Portion of the graph of f is shown above, along with its tangent line at f equals at x equals zero. So we've got the function f passing through like this, and then we have the tangent line passing through like that. And then selected derivatives of f evaluated at zero are given in the table. So we know the second derivative's value at zero, the third derivative's value at zero, the fourth derivative's value at zero, and so on. What part A asks us to do is to write the third degree Taylor polynomial for f about zero. So if you know the formula for a Taylor series expansion for a function, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to put zero in place of the c's in that to, to make it a, a Maclaurin expansion. So we're going to evaluate the kth derivative at zero, divide by k factorial, and then multiply by x minus zero, or just x when it's based at zero, to the kth power. So when I'm building the third degree Taylor polynomial, I need to list enough terms of this expansion in order to see an x to the third power and nothing above that. So I know I'm going to have the function evaluated at 0 divided by 0 factorial times x to the 0. 0 factorial is 1. x to the 0 is 1. So the first term is just going to be f of 0. I'm then going to have the first derivative evaluated at 0 divided by 1 factorial times x to the first. You see that represented right here. I'm then going to have the second derivative evaluated at 0 divided by 2 factorial times x to the second represented here. And finally, the third derivative evaluated at zero divided by three factorial times x to the third gives us our third degree polynomial. Now you can't leave your answer like I have it right here. That's the general third degree Taylor polynomial for any function f. We need to make it specific to this particular function and its derivatives. So the thing that they provided you with this graph for is to allow you to reason out what f of 0 is. So f of 0 is the y value on this graph at 0, which is 3. You also need to know f prime of 0. Well, the tangent line to that graph is coming down through the graph like this. And if you do a quick rise, negative 2, divided by run, 1, that gives you the slope of the tangent line and the value of f prime of 0. You're going to have to add on the second derivative evaluated at 0 divided by 2 factorial. Take that from the table. Here's the second derivative evaluated at 0. And then you're going to have to add on to that the third derivative evaluated at 0, negative 23 halves, divided by 3 factorial, which is 6. This would definitely receive full credit, this line right here. I cleaned it up a little bit. We're going to do more work with this in the next few parts. So we benefit from cleaning it up and, and making sure it's accurate and as nice as possible right now. Part B asks us for the first three non-zero terms for the Maclaurin series for e to the x. So the Maclaurin series for e to the x goes from 0 to infinity, and the rule for it is x to the k divided by k factorial. So the, the k equals 0 term, the k equals first term, and the k equals 2 term are going to be the first three non-zero terms of that series. They then ask us to write the second degree Taylor polynomial for e to the x times f of x about zero. We have, a, we have the first few pieces of a series for f of x in part a. So I just copied the portion of the series for f of x from part a right into part b here, and I'm multiplying it together with the first three terms of the series for e to the x, which we were asked to list to start off part b in order to develop the series for the product between e to the x and f of x. So I'm multiplying those together. Now what the directions ask is they ask us for a second degree Taylor polynomial for e to the x, f of x. So if I'm multiplying these together, as I ex think about expanding polynomial times polynomial, what's going to give me my constant terms? Well, the only multiplications that are going to give me constant terms is when I do 1 times 3, not even multiplications. One multiplication gives us a constant term. First times first is going to give us that. I now know I'm going to try to figure out what gives me x to the first terms. Well, if I multiply this 1 together with this minus 2x, I get an x to the first term. If I multiply this x together with this 3, I get another x to the first term. So my x to the first terms are going to be negative 2x plus 3x. 
I need a second degree Taylor polynomial. So I also need to generate all of my x squared terms. So my x squared terms are going to come from, let's see, 1 times positive 3 halves x squared gives me an x squared term. So you see I've represented that. Um, if I multiply x and negative 2x, I'm going to end up with an x squared. And this would be that term. And if I multiply this term, 1 half x squared, together with this constant term, I'm going to get another x squared term. So I've grouped all of my x terms, grouped all of my x squared terms. Any other multiplications I would do in the expansion of this is going to generate a power that's above 2. I don't need to worry about that because I'm going for the second degree Taylor polynomial. This would receive full credit, this line right here. I did clean it up a little bit, just kind of combine the like terms. And p sub 2 of x, I don't need this there. Let me get rid of that. Uh, the second degree Taylor polynomial for this e to the x, f of x product is shown right here. Part C says, all right, new function h. h is defined like this. So the input to h is in the upper limit of integration, but we do see that the integral depends on f. So f of t is the integrand. Use the Taylor polynomial found in part a to find an approximation for h of 1. All right. So in part a, we had these terms. Now in part a, they had x's in these spots. I replaced them with t since we obviously see f of t right here. And what I'm going through a few steps to do is I'm going through a few steps to simplify my expression that approximates h of x. So I find the antiderivative of 3 with respect to t, the antiderivative of this with respect to t, of that with respect to t, and the antiderivative of this term with respect to t. Right, so just power rule across the board there, adding 1 to the power, dividing by the new power. I need to evaluate this antiderivative at x, evaluate it at 0, and take a difference. When I evaluate any of these terms at 0, they all are 0, so I don't really have to worry about that. So I basically just replace all the t's with x's, and I have a way to approximate h of x using my series from part a. Now what we're asked to do is we're asked to approximate h of 1. So I've got to use this Taylor polynomial that approximates h, evaluate it at 1, in order to approximate h of 1. Uh, this right here would receive full credit. I did basically get rid of the ones when I went from here to here and some of the exponents. I didn't take this any further. I looked ahead, realized we weren't going to need to take it any further. And uh, I guess I was lazy when I was writing this up, and I, I just didn't feel like finding common denominators of 48 and, and putting everything together. So just left my answer looking like that. You can definitely do a little bit of extra legwork that, that I bailed on and uh, finish it up with a, a slightly nicer value than what I have as my end result. Last part of this says that the Maclaurin series for h converges to h of x for all real numbers. We also know that the terms of the series for h of 1, that's what we used back in part c, alternate in sign and decrease in absolute value to 0. So that sentence is basically saying the series that represents the value of h of 1 is a converging alternating series. Use the alternating series error bound to show that the approximation found in part C differs from H of 1 by at most 0.45. They've all but pushed us in the direction of finding our error bound with an alternating series error bound. They, they flat out said that, right? So the alternating series error, the, the most off you can be with an estimate for a converging alternating series, like we did back here in part C, is going to be from the magnitude of the first omitted term. So the error is going to be less than or equal to the value of the first omitted term. So the first omitted term from back on this top line was the, the coefficient that went with it and the t to the fourth term. So you'll see what I did is I figured out what that coefficient was. It would be the fourth derivative evaluated at 0 divided by 4 factorial times t to the fourth. 4 factorial is 24. The fourth derivative of f evaluated at 0 is in the table, 54. I did the antiderivative of that t to the fourth piece, got t to the fifth divided by 5, evaluated at 1 technically evaluated at 0, but once again, that piece is 0, so it's not essential to show. Uh, and I ended up with this expression. And if you look at this expression, 
Top times top gives me a 9. Bottom times bottom gives me a 20. If you figure out what 9 twentieths is, it's equal to 0.45. And that's exactly what we were trying to show, to show that our error with our estimate in Part C was less than 0.45. And we've proven that with the alternating series error bound.